Now, I've read so many incredible books in the last couple months, especially by really smart, brave, fucked up women, of which there is one. So I asked if she would come tonight, and um, I'm, I've also got another friend later who's going to read some, some of his own writing. I asked Lori if she would read a passage from her book to, you know, enlighten us. I don't know what she's going to read. I'm really looking forward to this. <laughs> Come on. Thank you, <laughs> So my book is Unspeakable Things, and I am reading from the very end, which is about being weird and not fitting in, and feminism. <laughs> Uh, revolution begins in the human imagination. They can come for us with clubs and guns, but as long as we continue to dream of different ways to live, different ways to love and fight and grow all together, they will not win. There is power in the communities built by exiles and outcasts. There is power in the societies of broken kids growing up to change the world. And when it comes down to it, we're all broken kids. Lost boys and fucked up girls just waiting to be found. We find each other in the unwatched spaces, in the secret places for as long as they last. We have the tools to build a better world in the wreck of the old one. The raw humanity of others is the unspeakable truth every mechanism of modern sexism is designed to disguise. If we have the courage to claim it, a change in consciousness is coming that will bring sexual and social revolution, that will free us to live and love more fully, and it will be exactly as terrifying as it sounds. That change in consciousness is coming from below, it's going to be led by women and queers and outsiders and weird kids and their allies. It's going to come from ugly girls, fat girls, girls who aren't thin enough, rich enough, white enough. Girls with thick thighs and bellies that wobble and voices that carry, voices that resonate. Girls who are fucking angry. <laughs> Girls who fuck for money, old women, trans women, sex workers. There are so many ways to fall off the pedestal patriarchy erects for the ideal woman and eventually you're going to have to decide if you're going to wait to fall or if you're going to jump. This is still a violent, bigoted world, a world of patriarchy that loves to make you hate yourself, especially if you're young or poor or weird or queer or a woman. <laughs> it loves to make you hurt yourself. It loves to make you police the behavior of others so that they remain as cowed as you feel, to cope with the intimate territory of neoliberal patriarchy. We've got to work on giving fewer fucks. <laughs> We've got to work on having no shame because we need no shame because none of us do unless we hurt another person. We must be comfortable with knowing too much but never knowing our place. We must stop letting stale old men define our dreams. <laughs> We must refuse to be ashamed of our desires, of our ambition, of our energy. We must refuse to judge others by any standard other than that of kindness and decency. We must not start out by apologizing for all that we are. It's about saying no and expecting that no to be respected. It is about, yeah. it's about owning your capacity to consent and exercising it actively again and again, not just in sexual terms, but in political terms too. Because when we are done hating ourselves and hurting each other, we can get on with asking for what should be ours by right. We have the technology now. 
We have the tools to liberate us from the privations of biology and the means to communicate without the mediation of the powerful and their paid mouthpieces. We have the technology to speak back to power, not just in one voice, but in many. A time is approaching when the humanity of women and girls and queer kids and weird kids and our allies will be understood in practice rather than acknowledged in passing. I believe that together we will find the courage to rewrite the old, tired scripts of work and power and sex and love, the old stories about what it means to be a beautiful woman, a strong man, a decent human being. I believe that the time is coming when those stories will be heard in numbers too big to silence. The great rewriting is already underway. Close your eyes. Turn the page. Begin. My, my book feels so stupid. <laughs> so look, but this, this little bit I've got to read from, is there's an issue with it, right? So, so this bit is, is about how funny English accents are. <laughs> and, uh, and, <laughs> yeah. and uh, I don't know, uh, if you've ever been English in America, you'll know that this is a magic bullet, right? And this is, this is Neil Gaiman using the magic bullet. <laughs> Seriously, there must be one of you out there and you know. You know. <laughs> right? Right? <laughs> okay, but, but this, this bit involves, so I'm going to have to do a fake American accent for part of this. <laughs> so please, like, please be kind because I really can't do one of those. Alright. Okay, I can, my, my American accent is like somewhere maybe around Tennessee, I think. <laughs> Um, okay, so it's me. I don't, I'm sorry, I'm not, I can't do it. <laughs> okay, so this is this is uh, this is the magic bullet section. Neil didn't dance. He wasn't much of a drinker. He didn't like hanging out in loud bars unless he had a book. <laughs> These things worried me. <laughs> But I was infatuated with his accent. <laughs> Say it again. <laughs> I, I know you don't, I know you don't. I just kind of say, say tomato. To, to me, tomato. He would deadpan, as if not enjoying this game at all. I would squeal with glee. Say it again. with schedule and banana and my very favourite waste paper basket. <laughs> One night I asked him to say it 15 times. <laughs> it didn't get old. Later in bed that same night when I wasn't expecting it he surprised me. Tomato. <laughs> This is good, I'm gonna do this. <laughs> I half opened my eyes and whimpered with pleasure, and then, sounding very pleased with myself with himself, he murmured, 